This video is based on a talk that I gave to a meeting of the Friends of Cromer Museum in February 2020. There is a section of stereo images of Cromer designed for viewing through red-blue spectacles. You'll still be able to see the pictures without the spectacles, but not the three-dimensional effect. Before the invention of photography, light had been used to cast shadows that could be traced with an engraving stylus onto a copper plate through a system of levers to scale the image down, producing a plate that could be inked and used to print multiple small images of the subject's outline. For centuries, it had been observed that an inverted image of the world outside a darkened room was visible on a surface opposite a small hole in a wall, and artists used this principle employing a lens to focus images using a portable device as seen here. Herschel used a camera obscura and was also experimenting with light sensitive chemicals, but was only able to make images of things laid in contact with coated paper. This process was called cyanotype in view of the blue colour of the images produced. A Frenchman, Daguerre, was a scenic painter who produced spectacular theatrical illusions in Paris. He used a camera obscura and was experimenting to try and capture the optical image. By chance he met and joined forces with another Frenchman, Nieps, who was also experimenting and had had some success with an eight-hour exposure making a lithographic printing plate. Four years later, Nieps died and Daguerre went on to perfect the new process that they had been working on, the Daguerreotype, which was announced on the 7th of January 1839. The process was complicated and used the properties of light-sensitive silver chemicals Plates were not very sensitive to light, but development using mercury vapour produced a good image. The daguerreotype process was expensive to use and hazardous owing to the use of poisonous mercury vapour. The daguerreotype of the man is seen from two different angles here, showing the portrait image and the silvery surface of the plate. The other picture has been tinted by hand to produce a coloured image. These small plates would have required an exposure in camera of about half a minute. The announcement of the daguerreotype prompted the Englishman Fox Talbot of Laycock Abbey in Wiltshire to announce his photographic process with which he had been making experimental images since 1835. His colour type process also used the properties of light sensitive silver compounds but his were coated on paper producing a negative image that could then be printed multiple times by contact with sheets of colour type paper. Whilst the daguerreotype process produced single well defined images colour types gave less distinct detail on account of diffusion the fibres of the paper gave. Talbot set up a studio in Reading and here we see a man photographing a picture at the left, a man having his portrait taken, a boy setting out contact printing frames for exposure by the sun, a man photographing a sculpture and another thought to measure light intensity. A colour type negative of Talbot's Laycock Gamekeeper and a colour type print from the negative. Frederick Scott Archer's collodion process of 1851 combined the benefits of the detail of the daguerreotype with the multiple print capability of the colour type. A drawback was that glass plates had to be coated with chemicals, exposed and processed before the coating had dried. Hence it was known as the wet plate process. A variation of the collodion process employed an underexposed image on glass or metal. The glass plate negative image from camera was mounted in front of a black paper or velvet giving a result that looked similar to that of the daguerreotype 
except that there was no mirror surface. The right hand picture here has been hand tinted and its background split to show reflected and transmitted light. The picture of the group at left is one image on black lacquered metal that had been exposed and processed in a special camera that could produce these instant images. Over the years improvements were made to photographic processes and a notable one was the use of albumen, the white of an egg, that could be used to hold the light sensitive chemicals on the paper surface. The significance of this was that because the coating stayed on the paper surface the images were well defined and they were not absorbed into the paper fibres. The popularity of visiting cards provided Victorian photographers with plenty of work. Like the Mace brothers who set up in Cromer in the late 19th century, they were mainly from Romany backgrounds and many travelled around practising their craft. Two images from the Mace brothers Norwich Road business and another the Tucky brothers who had set up business in Church Street. Portraits from Carte de Visite by Thomas Mack who had a jewellery business in Church Street. The discovery that gelatin could be used as a binder for the light sensitive chemicals was a major breakthrough. Developments brought shorter exposure times as well as plates that could be used with dry chemical coatings that enabled processing to be carried out at a later time. Olivides' printing frame can be seen in Cromer Museum. There will be more about Olive later. These pairs of stereo images of Cromer are from the Cromer Museum. Each pair shows images photographed from slightly different viewpoints, just as we see things with our two eyes. If we can arrange to see the images on the cards that way, such as in a stereo viewer, then we see a three-dimensional representation of the scene. I could see that this pair had been taken with a single lens camera with two separate exposures, as a cart appears to be in one, but not the other. More commonly, a twin lens camera would have been used so that both images could be made at the same instant. If you have the special spectacles, put them on now, otherwise you will not get the three-dimensional effect, but you will see the pictures. The church seen before Church Street was built up. Here you see the jetty that predated the current pier and a trading vessel on the beach. It would have been refloated at high tide. Some benches seen on the beach here. Back at the vicarage garden, three boys sitting on the grass. A man stands precariously on the edge of the cliff. People looking out to sea with the jetty below them. That was the last of the stereo images, so you'll not need to use spectacles again. Because photography was quite an involved process, its use was limited to people who had the time and ability to operate the equipment. But in 1889, the American company Eastman Kodak made it accessible to everyone when they introduced roll film. The light sensitive chemicals, the emulsion, was coated onto a flexible nitrocellulose base that was rolled up and inserted into a box camera. The operator just had to aim the camera, press the shutter, wind on the film roll and take the next picture 
until the whole roll was exposed. The original camera was sent back to Kodak for processing and being fitted with a fresh roll of film. Olive Edis used a folding roll film camera as a backup to her plate camera work. When cameras are tilted, such as when one wants to include the top of a building in a picture, the verticals of the architecture appear to be leaning inwards. If the camera is set level when at normal ground level, too much foreground will be included and the top of the subject cut off in the image. The professional photographer used a camera that had a rising front to raise the lens so that buildings could be recorded with upright verticals. The original photographic materials were only sensitive to blue light, so many colours recorded with dark tones. This is probably why Victorian people appear in dark clothes in their portraits. Developments in emulsions in the 1870s brought sensitivity into the green part of the spectrum, so colours could be reproduced with improved tonality. It was not until 1906 that full colour sensitivity was extended into the red part of the spectrum. Although orthochromatic emulsions did a good job, as most red subjects do reflect some blue and green light as well as red. Colour photography processes are nearly all based on creating monochrome images of the red, green and blue parts of the spectrum separately, and either viewing them through coloured filters or replacing the monochrome images into coloured dyes during processing. The most successful of the early colour processes was the autochrome. This process used a mosaic of red, green and blue dyed starch grains on the surface of the photographic plate, acting as a filter through which the photograph was exposed. The emulsion then had to be reversal processed so that a positive image rather than a negative was produced. When viewed, it was seen through the same dyed grains through which the exposure had been made and a coloured image was seen. This process is known as an additive process, whereas later processes favoured a subtractive system that employed yellow, magenta and cyan dyes that were produced during processing. Here is a self-portrait of professional photographer Olive Edis, taken in her Sheringham studio using the autochrome process. You can see the window that was behind her in the picture of the room. There are skylights above that would have enabled her to control lighting using blinds. Olive moved to a new studio in Sheringham in 1936 and you can see the skylights there from the outside. She also used studios in London and Farnham in Hampshire. Here we see Olive Edis on a professional assignment in Canada. Her camera lens had no shutter, but you can see that she is using one attached to the front of her camera. In order to control the light reaching her film, she would have used one of these stops slotted into the lens to adjust its aperture. This equipment is in the Chroma Museum. These are some of Olivides' portraits of Sheringham and Cromer characters and includes the first autochrome that she made. Olive was in demand by the rich and famous. Her subjects included politicians and royalty as well as local folk. This 180 degree view of Cromer Beach was taken on a single piece of film, although the print was actually made in three sections and put together. The camera, like this one, had a curved film plane so that as the lens panned across the scene, its distance to the film would be maintained constant. The postal view card became popular 
early in the 20th century as people wanted to include a view of their holiday location when writing home to friends and family. I've put this selection of postcards together with the publishers' names. They would not necessarily have been the photographers but may have commissioned the images to sell through their shops. You can see from these Sepoy rescue cards that H. H. Tansley used other photographs, as well as his own, to make up a series of images. In the card at bottom right, I am sure that I can detect that the man on the rigging has been drawn on when I view the original through a magnifier. Frith's is one of the best known postcard suppliers who had photographers working all round the world and Norwich firm Gerald's published cards from many parts of this country. A final selection of locally published postcards of Cromer. Note that the photographer in Rebecca Lush's wall painting in Cromer Museum is using a rising front camera to maintain her subject's verticals.